Hello folks, welcome to my Sunday morning prattle number eight and I'm going to talk about the differing sizes of guitars and their purpose and the naming thereof. Now I now have the, the set, isn't this terrible? I have my Eastman E20P which is a size O, I have my Eastman E40 double O which is a double O, I have my Collings triple O 2H triple O and of course my beloved Collings Dreadnought all modelled on Martins you'll, be, you'll see that there are no Martins in this room at the moment because they don't make any of these anymore um, so I'm not going to go too much into the origin of guitars but in the 1800s and before uh, guitars were tiny little, little things uh, very rarely used in concert but they were largely the playthings of, uh, of women designed for women so I'm going to approach this business about the naming of guitars what is a parlor okay well there never was a guitar called a parlor guitar now I've read quite a lot about this my terms of reference are loads and loads and loads of books upstairs but not least my wonderful 1924 Martin guitar catalogue Mute Martin string instruments I should say including mandolins and mandolas and ukuleles and tarot patches whatever that is so with the exception of the um, a Gibson Mandolin and Banjo Company most took their, uh, their designs from Martin um, designs of the late 1800s into the twin uh, yeah into the into the 1900s 19th 20th century in 1924 they listed them as size 2 as an amateur 12 inch wide body I had a 217 once it was lovely uh, a size 1 which was standard from about 1898 you don't see standard guitars but very often um, and then they had a size O which they called concert now this is where it gets important the size double O was called a grand concert and the triple O which kind of was first introduced in 1902 but didn't really get going until the early 20s uh, was an auditorium let's break down those so they were building guitars various sizes for various venues or maybe numbers of people listening to unamplified guitars um, being played for the enjoyment of an amassed group Let's have a think about that. Um, let's let's think about the amateur one. Well, that's obviously for playing at home. Um, the size O, defined as concert, one might infer that was designed for use in a front parlour. Now, why do I say that? The parlour, which comes from the French parloir, was a front room or reception room to receive or meet people in your own private house. Uh, theoretically and depending on the size of one's house and the number of friends, relations or visitors one has, one might well foregather and entertain in the front room. And of course in the days of pianos in every home it was always in the front room. It's also a good place to lay out the dead because people lived in the back room. Um, and um, so maybe we could say that the front room, the reception room, the parlour was the place where people might gather to take a glass of sherry and someone might play upon a little guitar, possibly the lady of the house. So what about this grand concert business? Well, a grand concert, where would you have that if you wanted to, to have an entertainment that was a little bit larger than your front room? Well, you would hire a church hall or a village hall. 
and that's what we do today or we did pre-covid and um and maybe you know sort of 40 50 maybe up to 100 people might gather there then we get to the auditorium now an auditorium i've been searching for a long time for a definition of an auditorium which literally means a hearing room um, or a space uh, the romans were rather good about making auditoria uh, and uh, i've stood in some of them and um, there's a semicircle of seats going up and the performers stand lower and project upwards and even thousands of years later they're extremely effective but an auditorium I have found is a place um, commonly thought of as a place with 300 or more seats 300 or more apparently Martin never designed for the kitchen bathroom or bedroom there we go so I'd say that if you have to attribute this fuzzy terminology of parlor guitar, then I would say a size O or smaller, but not larger. Not the double O, not the triple O, and certainly not the dreadnought. That brings me on to what is a dreadnought guitar. A dreadnought guitar was a larger guitar developed, of course, by Martin um, and made for the Ditson Company, won't go into all that, we all know about that, and introduced with their own branding uh, in 1931. And this is the original Dreadnought design, 12 frets, wider neck, um, better placed um, bridge. Why do I always do that? I just can't stop enjoying a G. Um, and in, it wasn't a great commercial success. It was described as gross by some as a bass guitar by others, uh, in as um, music changed, the guitar went through a radical change of use and in 1929 they brought out the OM designed to, to compete with um, Gibson Archtops, come to that in a moment, and, um, uh, and, and they squished down the body and they made the, 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 the neck thinner and effectively longer 14 frets and it became a rhythm instrument rather than for more intricate playing with the left hand. Um, so what did they call it? Did they call it a, a quadruple O or anything like No, they didn't. It got clumsy. They called it D for Dreadnought, named after the famous uh, British battleship and all that sort of stuff. Um, Martin prefixed all their dreadnoughts with a D, okay, that makes sense, but also in 1934 Gibson came out with a competing instrument called a jumbo, they called it a jumbo, they could have called it an elephant but they called it a jumbo and it looked remarkably like this, this is not a slope shoulder dreadnought, this is a jumbo, just like I don't know, Pontiac don't make Mustangs or whatever. Um, it certainly was made in competition to the Dreadnought, but it had some vital differences. Although I have to say that the slope shoulder, oh dear, aspect was probably influenced by the original Dreadnought, but they are not the same in any way, shape or form. <laughs> um, but this business about Calling a jumbo a dreadnought or a sloped shoulder dreadnought, for goodness sake, carries on and is used by people who really ought to know better. Santa Cruz. The vintage jumbo is the ideal blues guitar inspired by the classic round shouldered dreadnought of the 1940s. What? Bourgeois, who really ought to know better. Slope-shouldered and square-shouldered dreadnoughts evolved from divergent lines of guitar DNA. Yeah, okay, Martin and Gibson. Curvier and ever so slightly wider and deeper than its counterpart, the slope Ds, what he means the jumbo. Most popular, important structural distinction lies in its short 25-inch scale, 24.9. 
Uh, 24 uh, and 7 eighths actually but that varied depending on where they were being made at any time by uh, by Gibson Collings the Collings Jumbo or CJ is our version of the classic sho sho slope shouldered dreadnought oh come on it's not it's a jumbo Collings Jumbo CJ Jumbo it's not a dreadnought a dreadnought is a standard scale, large bodied guitar, either in original 12 fret or the, um, and of course, um, uh, the, uh, la -la 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 um, uh, the advanced jumbo is a, is, is a standard scale, um, but um, it's either the 12 fret configuration or the 14 fret rhythm style, which is proved popular because when they came out, that's all people could get, so they did as what they could with that instrument. <laughs> So, I've mentioned jumbo. There's nothing wrong with that word. It's not offensive. Elephants haven't lodged any um, objections. And um, of course, Gibson later um, brought out an even larger guitar uh, called the Super Jumbo, which is prefixed by S and J. It's remarkably reminiscent of Super Jumbo. So why do people call the large bodied instruments, the largest bodied instruments, jumbos. They're not. They're super jumbos. Okay. Right. So, what's an arch top? Mmm. The concept of making mandolins initially and then guitars in the same way as violins, or the violin family, with a carved arched top and carved arched back was to make first the mandolins much stronger and with more projection and the same applied to guitars and the principle is different to a flat top guitar whereas on a flat top the strings are pulling the top up to make it resonate on the arch top uh, they're pushing them down this gives you as a more middly to trebly but very very high in projection instrument. So invented by Orville Gibson and perfected by Lloyd Law in the early 20s. Now then, the whole point of this is to make a body which is tends to be thinner than um, the, uh, the flat tops that we see now, um, but it was to give that presentation, that projection, uh, primarily as a replacement to tenor banjos in um, in, in dance bands, etc. So, why, 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 why would you put electronics in it? Now, if you and I've seen some lovely guitars ruined by this. People buy it, buy them, and then they screw a pickup onto there, and the feedback putting screwing something a magnetic pickup onto a well project. Um, resonating top uh, just gives you loads and loads of feedback what you need to do if people do and you see lots of people with, with built in they put basically a fence post inside to kill the resonance of the arch top so is that an arch top now it's a guitar that looks like an arch top but it's an electric guitar it is no longer an acoustic guitar Yes, it will make some sounds like a Fender Telecaster would make, not plugged in, but it is no longer a resonant arch top with an arched, a carved top and a carved back to perform that degree of resonance. So, there we go, my friends. That is Andy's Roundup. A parlor, you can say, was a size zero or smaller. A dreadnought is something made in the image of a Martin original or 14 fret dreadnought. A jumbo is something made in the image of a Gibson original jumbo. And an SJ is something else again. And they should be defined properly. And that's my rant for today. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday and uh, I hope to see you soon. Bye.